People thought Navy Lieutenant Alton Grizzard would be an admiral someday. But he was found shot in both legs, abdomen, and head. Ensign Corinne O'Neill was loved by everybody, 21-year-old, honor student, track star at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. She too was found dead, not far from Grizzard, curled up in a fetal position. Not far from her was midshipman George Smith, 24, who was set to ship out in a few days as an engineer on a nuclear submarine. He too was shot in the head, presumably by the same gun that had killed the other two, and then he shot himself. Smith and uh, O'Neill were engaged to be married, but she broke up with him four days earlier. Next day, he sent her a 13-page letter begging her to take him back. Four hours before the murder, he, he was heard arguing with Corinne outside her apartment. 1.45 a.m., he came back and found her in her sixth-floor apartment, Grizzard that was there with him. Angry words were shared, and then the shooting began. Think of the untold heartache for not only these three being killed, but the dozens of family members and friends. That's what murder does. Rage, anger, bitterness, murder, causing so much mess. That's why God says you shall not murder. This is the sixth in our series of messages, the original top ten. The sixth commandment is a simple one-liner, you shall not murder. We look at that and we think, well, I haven't murdered anybody, I guess I got that one. Why don't we move on to the seventh commandment? But on closer examination, this one may be the most difficult one to keep. If you find this commandment irrelevant, maybe you're interpreting it too narrowly. I think there are four applications to this commandment. First is no murder. This commandment denies us the right to take the life of someone else with harmful intent. In 1946, there were a few shooting deaths in Chicago, Illinois. Last year, there were 762 shooting deaths. And 3,550 shooting injuries. I mean, what's going on? Since Columbine High School massacre in 1999, there have been over 100 shootings in schools or colleges. I think the most frightening thing about all of that is most of the people that caused the carnage seem so normal. I mean, from New Jersey, Amy Grossman and her boyfriend went into, or rented a hotel and gave birth in the hotel room, and then killed the baby. The girl that became known as the prom mom left the dance floor, went into the bathroom, gave birth to her child, dumped it in the trash can, and then returned to the floor. I mean, what's going on? It seems to be there's been a loss of moral belief in the high value of every human being. The toughest ones to deal with are murders that are done with a theological or rationale. Every once in a while, you'll we'll get a report of someone who'll say, God, you know, murder, God told me to do it. But dwarfing those incidents are the 18,492 killed by Islamist jihadists since 2001. Wikipedia reports that three times that many people were injured in those terrorist attacks. Uh, we can't be naive about Islamic terrorism. Now, Bill Qureshi, in his book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, tells about growing up overseas 
in a Muslim family. He was steeped in Islam, a strict family. Then he came to college in the United States and he was assigned a roommate, a guy named David, who was equally strong Christian. So the two got into conversations about their faith and what's true, what's not true, and it forced Nabil to really study his faith like never before. He read the Quran on his own for the first time. And the Hadith, Hadith are the traditions uh, of acts and sayings of Muhammad written by several followers of Muhammad. He found that he had received in his upbringing sort of an airbrushed, peaceful version of Muhammad. And he finds that Westerners are, are given the same uh, education. He says he can't count the number of times that he's seen on CNN or MSNBC or ABC uh, a quotation of Quran 532, uh, the discouragement of murder. But they fail to read the first part of that verse, which shows that that prohibition is given to Jews. It's not even meant for Muslims. The part for Muslims is the next verse. The penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive upon earth to cause corruption is none but that they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land. You have to worship Allah, and if you don't, then you're to be killed or at best exiled. So I read the Hadith, and uh, one was uh, once by Guillaume, and he tells about uh, Muhammad ordering uh, the, mur uh, the killing of a, a woman with five children around her. She was nursing one, and afterwards the, the warrior said, and I wasn't too comfortable with that. Muhammad had no remorse. After the Battle of Trench, Muhammad killed uh, 500 men and teenage boys. And then he sold their wives and children into slavery, and then they divided up their goods. So Nabil is telling about this in his book, and he says, you know, I can't dismiss all these accounts. Some of the Muslims he talked with to say, what do you, how do you deal with this? They said, well, the, uh, uh, the 500 he killed were all Jews at, at Karaza, and they got what was coming to them. But Nabil says, I can't make that conclusion. How many can I dismiss and still believe what I've been taught? So ultimately, he came to the point where he said, you know what? I can't uh, believe that anymore, and he committed his life to Christ. Since his conversion to Christ, he wrote the book. He's uh, shared his faith with many people, and he's now very sick with cancer. He's, he's dying. He's in Houston he has stomach cancer. There's nothing more they can do. But in his short life, since he gave his life to Christ, he's led thousands of Muslims to Christ. Had a powerful uh, testimony. What's my point? My point is that uh, when we examine our struggle with Islamic terrorism, it won't do to just conclude that Islam is peaceful and we're just dealing with extremists. Jihad or religious fighting is embedded in the heart of Islam. Murder with a theological rationale is the hardest to deal with. The Sixth Commandment does not prohibit all killing. Uh, killing of animals is okay. Uh, capital punishment. Uh, the government is allowed to enforce its laws. A uh, war. <clears throat> But there's a qualitative difference between premeditated murder and self-defense or accidental manslaughter. Exodus 21, anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, it is, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are to flee to a place I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. And then in, Exodus, in Leviticus 19, do not pervert justice, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. In the Old Testament, you pay for your own crime until Christ comes and pays for all our crimes on the cross. Now compare this with Hammurabi's code. If a man strikes a gentleman's daughter... 
so that she dies, then his own daughter is to be put to death. If the man strikes the daughter of a poor man so that she dies, then the man shall pay one half minna. Quite a contrast with the Old Testament where all people are treated equally under the law, rich and poor. The law provides for equal justice under the law which is a core principle of Western law. You find this in Moses' law, but not Hammurabi's. In God's law, no one is permitted to commit murder and all receive equal treatment under the law. The second application of this commandment is no vengeance. Exodus 21. Why don't you read this with me? 22 to 25. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. This is one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament, or at least one that most people know, eye for an eye. Most people think of that as terrible. But it's actually meant to be a restraint on vengeance. Uh, It's a limitation on runaway punishment. I mean, this is how wars start. One nation attacks another. The other responds with an attack and they throw in a little extra for good measure. Then the other one hits back a little harder and away it goes. This command insists on no vengeance. Leviticus 19, do not seek seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Apostle Paul, do not repay evil, anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is, this is a famous line, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. If we take vengeance into our own hands, we violate the sixth commandment. So if you feel you do not have a problem with murder, you don't think you have a problem with vengeance, there's still a third application. No hatred. Jesus raises the bar in Matthew 5.21. Why don't you read this with me? You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus says there's more than one way to murder someone. You may not think of lifting a gun or a knife, but if you harbor feelings of anger, and you have such contempt for somebody else that you call them a worthless person. He says you're on your way to breaking the sixth commandment. He uses the Greek word orge, which means kind of a seething, simmering anger. Cam and I did the journal last night, and uh, uh, we both, when we got to this one, you know, have you murdered anybody? We both said, I don't think so, but we probably have broken this commandment because we've been angry with plenty of people. But we both thought, well, we don't really have seething, boiling up anger, so we're probably not in danger of murder. At least that made us feel better about ourselves. John says in 1 John three twelve. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no one, that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So hating is included uh, in this commandment. Fourth grade girl wrote the following note to a classmate she detested. Dear awful Janet, you're the stinkiest girl in this world. I hope you die, but of course I suppose that's impossible. I've got some ideas. Play in the road, cut your throat, drink poison, knife yourself. 
Please do some of this. We all hate you. I'm praying, oh, please, Lord, let Janet die. We're in need of fresh air. Did you hear me, Lord? Because if you didn't, we'll all die with her. Wanda Jackson. I mean, who would deny that those biting words are any less worse than actually murder itself? I mean, this brings it close to home. When you hate somebody so much, it's, it's really the same as leading to murder because you want to get that person out of your way. This brings it close to home because we realize that many of us, our, our anger has been devoted to the people closest to us, people with whom we live. I mean, you can love someone and be angry at the same time, right? Charlie Shedd found this out after he'd had a little fight with his wife the next morning and found a note on the counter. Dear Char Charlie, I hate you. Love, Martha. <laughs> you may not have murdered, but is your heart free of hatred? I mean, you can feel the hatred today in the political discourse in our country. It just feels like it's getting worse and worse. And, and now it's leading to violence. You know, like the congressman who was shot last week? No murder, no vengeance, no hatred are all in the negative. But all the Ten Commandments also have a grand positive. If not, you could conclude that if you don't do anything, you've pleased God. God. The person who doesn't do anything at all has the best shot at getting into heaven. You get to heaven, you're 85 years old, you say, I didn't murder anybody. You're, you're expecting a pat on the back. But Jesus says, but did you love your neighbor? That was included in the sixth command? Well, of course. Apostle Paul writes, why don't you read this with me? Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law." Love is the grand positive of all of the last five commandments. You may not have murdered. You may not have taken vengeance into your own hand. Maybe you aren't even harboring hatred. But have you loved your neighbor? That's what it means to keep the sixth commandment. So this commandment helps us think about issues of our day. Suicide. To take One's own life rejects the high value God has placed on every human life, so it's prohibited by this command. War. It's never to be entered into lightly. Never fight an unjust war. The war must have noble goals, minimal, limited loss of, of life, and the war must be winnable. If the war is not winnable, don't get in it. It may be the lesser of two evils, but it's never a good choice. It results in the taking of lives made in the image of God. I mean, World War II, 20 million Russians were killed, 6.5 million Germans, 6 million Jews, 1 million allies. 70,000 people died at Hiroshima. The Vietnam War, 3 million Vietnamese were killed, 58,000 Americans. And I already told you, Islamic terrorism since 2000. One has claimed 18,492 lives. All these people killed were made in the image of God, infinitely valuable. Abortion. I cannot agree with people who believe abortion is a woman's choice. It involves another human life. So it's a community decision. The sixth commandment is good news. It tells us God values our lives so much that you should not... Take your life lightly or anyone else's life lightly. You are precious to God, so much so that He sent His Son to die for you. Every one of us breaks this command. 
every time we fail to love or harbor hatred, we fail. And it drives us to our knees asking God to give us mercy. But here's the good news. Jesus did not die just to provide us forgiveness. He rose from the dead and gave us His Holy Spirit to live in us, to give us new hearts that desire to please God. So how can we grow at keeping this commandment? Let me give you three suggestions. One, give your life to Jesus and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, Jesus, I admit that I have broken this commandment. There are people I can't stand. There are people that drive me nuts. It's possible that I hate them. Please forgive me. I need your mercy. Come into my life. I believe you rose from the dead. And would you give me your Holy Spirit and give me a new heart. And I need to re- help me rely on your Holy Spirit. Second, reconcile with your brother or sister. Jesus says in Matthew 5.23, read this with me. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. So Jesus says, If you come and you're taking communion, you're worshiping, and you remember that somebody else has something against you, stop your worship. Go reconcile with them. It's that important. Now, I do so many stupid things. I've had to work my way through the steps of reconciliation, but I'm always amazed at the number of followers of Christ that don't seem to know these four steps. So let me share them with you. For some of you, this is a reminder. First thing you say is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I did that. But that alone is not enough because the person's response is likely, I'm sorry you said that too. It was really dumb what you did. So that doesn't really get you anywhere, but most people think that's it. I'm sorry, you know, that's it. The second thing you have to say is, I was wrong. Okay, now you're actually admitting you did something wrong. But don't add the cheap little word, if. I don't know how many times I've heard this. If I did something wrong, what that really means is, I don't think I was wrong. You do, because you're thin-skinned. Just skip the word if. I was wrong. Admit it. Third step is, will you forgive me? Now you're giving the person a chance to say, Okay, I'll accept your apology, and you're right, you were wrong, and they might forgive you. If so, you've achieved uh, some level of reconciliation. If they say no, then you have more work to do. I mean, I often get to this point with Jory. I'm sorry, I was wrong, will you forgive me? No, you're just going to do it again. Which leads to the fourth point. I will try to never do it again. Okay? I mean, she says, you know, you you never change. Well, if you don't have a plan to change, then the I am wrong, I'm sorry, are just kind of words. Now, I used to say, I will never do it again, and I kind of have learned that that's a little too much promise. So, I will try to never do it again. Seems a little more realistic. Three, reconcile quickly. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 25. Why don't you read this with me? Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Reconciling quickly will protect you from so much heartache. Bitterness, depression, hatred, lawsuits, murder. Failure to resolve conflict and deal with his anger quickly led Ensign George Smith into the deep, dark tunnel of hatred and murder and suicide. Murder and suicide marked the end of the road 
if we keep walking down the path of unresolved anger and hatred. Don't linger on that path. There is nothing good by staying on that path. Get rid of your anger. Reconcile with your brother or sister. Forgive. It might be a mate. Maybe it's with a child. Maybe it's with a parent. Maybe it's with a teammate or a classmate or a work associate or a neighbor. Whoever it is, resolve the conflict right away. It's the sixth commandment. Lord Jesus, thank you for updating this commandment for us. You shall not murder and raising the bar and helping us realize we all are guilty. I want to give you a chance to respond to God. Whenever you read God's Word, I think it's important you respond. Why don't you tell Him what you've heard today? Maybe there's someone that you know you, are, you just can't stand, and it's, it's boiling over. Why don't you tell God you want to forgive that person and reconcile with them? Maybe there are feelings of hatred you're harboring in your heart. Tell Him you want to get rid of those. Help you with those. Ask Him to forgive you. Let's all pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing us pray. And uh, we really do. Uh, everyone is made in the image of you. They're highly valuable. So we don't want to hate them, resent them, murder them, of course. So help us with that, Lord, to love other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.